So anyway, so uh, Dennis said I couldn't give my Turing Award talk. <clears throat> so you're going to get a different talk. And what this is is uh, my view of what big data means, means to me. And I'll talk to it in the context of disruption because if there's no, no disruption, then the, then the big elephants will just continue to do their thing. Not, nothing much is going to change. So most of this will be about what's likely to, to disrupt the big data market. And then the other context is the 800-pound gorilla in the corner, which is where is their big pain, which again means you know, disruption and opportunity. So what does big data mean? Well, I take a very simplistic view. It's the three V's. And uh, you don't have to take pictures of the slides. You guys have the slides. <laughs> so, it, it, so it means the th uh, three V's. You've either got a big data problem because you've got too much of it. You've got a volume problem. Or it's coming at you too fast and you have a velocity problem. Or it's coming at you from too many places and you have a variety problem. So in terms of big volume, uh, there's sort of two subcategories that I want to talk about. One is if all you want to do is SQL analytics, count sum, max, min, average, group by, predicates, that stuff. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is more complex analytics that goes under the rubric data science. I'll talk about both of those. So there really be four topics. So let's start with you're happy with doing uh, SQL analytics and you want to do it on petabytes of data. Well, this is, in my opinion, a solved problem. It's solved in that I know of about 20 or so production databases that are, ter that are petascale on large clusters that are in production doing SQL analytics on huge amounts of data. So, for example, Vertica is one of the warehouse vendors in this space. Their largest customer is a company called Zynga, uh, which is here in San Francisco, does the game Farmville and a bunch of other games. And every time you click on anything in any Zynga game, a record gets entered into a data warehouse somewhere or other. Uh, it's got about five petabytes of data right now and is being used day in, day out uh, for production analytics. So there's lots of examples of this stuff in practice uh, on petabytes of data on very large clusters, think 500 and up nodes. And by and large, these customers are not unhappy with their database systems. You know, they're, they're struggling with operational problems like what, how do you, how do you uh, replace nodes on, on you know, a big cluster without going down and all that kind of stuff. So operations are difficult, but not the data manager. So uh, I consider this solved. So if you think there's going to be any disruption, uh, you know, the big vendors are pretty good at this stuff. So the one thing you do need to know is that of the various vendors who are all ostensibly offering column stores, which is the right technology to offer, uh, with compression on all the columns, uh, performance among the various offerings differs by a lot. Think one to two orders of magnitude. So if you're actually going to buy one of these puppies, it's important to figure out whether it's going to work well on your workload and test more than one product. The other thing is some vendors are on version 1 or version 2. Others are on version 8. Uh, that correlates perfectly with how many bugs you can expect to see. So maturity and, and reliability is going to differ by a lot. Uh, Oracle, which is a big uh, player in the database space, does not have a column store and does not run uh, shared nothing on multiple nodes, even though their marketing claims uh, to the contrary. So my favorite uh, joke about Oracle is you want to know what hardware platform Oracle runs the best on. Anyone want to take a guess? PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> a 35 millimeter slide projector or its modern-day equivalent PowerPoint. Uh, 
Some products are native column stores, meaning they were written originally as a column store. Some products used to be row stores until they realized that column stores were an order of magnitude or more faster. And so they have converted from, from row stores to column stores. In some cases, that conversion is not yet done. So beware of anybody who used to be a row store. And some products have a serious marketing problem, meaning they're invisible. Other products have a serious marketing problem, which is they lie to you and claim that they do something that they don't actually do. So all the commercial products, uh, customer beware. But now let's turn to what's going to change in this market. Uh, so here are some possible disruptions. First one is NVRAM is right around the corner. Uh, Facebook uh, is a big enthusiast of running stuff on NVRAM. Uh, what, what, what is NVRAM? Non-volatile non memory. So non-volatile memory is faster than flash uh, and not much more expensive. So it will, it, it will allow you to say my uh, storage hierarchy is L2 cache, uh, then main memory, then NVRAM, then flash, then disk. Now, no serious systems person is going to suggest trying to manage a five-level hierarchy. So some number of these levels are going to be interesting, some, uh, but not all of them, and uh, your mileage will vary. Anyway, uh, NVRAM is going to be an element of the storage hierarchy and is not going to be particularly disruptive to the current vendors. The thing that might be somewhat disruptive is that 40 gig E is coming, and all of these products have been engineered to try very hard not to send, not to use network bandwidth. So they've all assumed that uh, networking is the high pole in the tent. There's a reasonable probability that that's no longer going to be true. Uh, if so, it gives you uh, more flexibility. Uh, but the main vendors in this space realize this and are, and are going to be adapting. The thing that's a little more problematic is that all the money in this market is, a, is at the high end. So if you want to run Vertica, which is one of the better systems in this space, and you have uh, a terabyte or less on three nodes or less, it's free. So the, the low end has been completely commoditized and cost nothing. So all the money is at the high end. Uh, so all of this is going to be modest disruption at best. Uh, the other thing to always keep in mind is that the size of data warehouses is getting bigger faster than resources are getting cheaper. So th this space is not getting any easier. It's going to remain hard at the high end, which means people are going to continue to pay uh, big bucks for these kind of systems at the high end. So these are not going to be serious storm clouds, but there is a serious storm cloud, which is these guys are all solving yesterday's problem. And uh, everyone will be happy to admit that as soon as Stanford and everybody else can train enough data scientists, the data science is going to replace business intelligence as the operational load against big warehouses. So uh, data scientists are not going to be retreaded business analysts. Uh, BI folks are just smart enough to run business, you know, the business intelligence tools that produce SQL queries on their behalf. Do you want to take questions as we go, or do you want to wait till the end? I don't know if you want to we'll never get through the talk if we, if we take questions now. OK, so why is data science such a good idea? Well, business intelligence will give you a big table of numbers, which you can look at with Tableau or whatever you want to look at. Or uh, you can have a predictive model that will allow you to generate some assumptions, and it will predict what is going to happen. So would you rather have a predictive model or a big table of numbers? Everybody in their right mind will take the predictive model. So this is going to happen. It may take a decade for us to train enough data scientists to actually be able to do this stuff, but it's certainly going to come. Now, what, is the, what does data science mean to me? Well, what, is it, what does a data scientist actually do? Uh, so 
he first of all tries to figure out what data set he wants to uh, run analytics on. That's data management. And then he does his favorite complex analytics. So he does clustering, he does predictive modeling, he does regression, dot, 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 dot. So the data management is SQL-like stuff. However, the complex analytics is mostly array-based calculations. It's linear algebra. To convince you of that, I want to do a very simple example. So this is something that's real accessible. And so uh, if you look on Wall Street and you look at the guys who do electronic trading, they're looking for patterns in the CNBC fire hose that goes by you, uh, you know, across the bottom of your screen. They've got 20 years worth of data uh, in as much detail as you want. So let's just look at the closing price on all trading days back 20 years uh, for two stocks, A and B. So if you think A and B are correlated, you'd like to compute the covariance of those two time series. And if they're positively correlated, if one goes up, you buy the other. If they're negatively correlated, if one goes up, you short the other and so forth. So that's kind of what uh, electronic traders want to do. So the red stuff at the bottom of the slide is the covariance uh, that I copied out of a linear algebra book. And it's correct, no one has disputed that it does what it says it does. So that's not very difficult. You can certainly do this calculation on your iPhone. So to make it interesting, there are about 15,000 publicly traded stocks in the US. There's 60,000 worldwide. If you look at the options market, it goes much bigger. Uh, but let's just use 15,000 US stocks. And we have 20,000, uh, we have, uh, we have Two th we have 20 years worth of data, which is approximately 4,000 trading days. So uh, what, what I want to do is do an all pairs covariance. For all 15,000 stocks, compute the covariance for all pairs of those stocks. OK, so the red stuff is there's a row for each stock, which is the 20-year history of its closing price, which is about 4,000 uh, cells long. So I want to do an all pairs covariance. And so what's the answer? Well, ignoring the constants and forgetting about subtracting off the mean, that computation is that red matrix stock times its transpose, times meaning matrix multiply. And so I could have put up uh, you know, singular value decomposition, all the other stuff people do. It all breaks down into this sort of stuff. So a lot of it is on top of matrix multiply or matrix multiply, matrix, matrix transpose. So if you want to do complex analytics, it's this kind of stuff. It's linear algebra. It's array-based calculations. It is not table-based. This is not a table calculation. So how do you support a data scientist who wants to do data management and he wants to do complex analytics like matrix multiply. So rewind about a decade, and the first option, which was proselytized by Google, was to say, well, just use MapReduce. So MapReduce you know, was a map operation, a reduce operation, uh, and Hadoop was the open source version of MapReduce. Uh, MapReduce was on top of the Google file system. HDFS is the open source version of that. So coded in MapReduce for HDFS. So the thinking at the time was Google, Google is a bunch of smart people. This is what they think is a good idea. So we'll just drink the Google Kool-Aid and do the same thing. So this was option one. Uh, drink the Google Kool-Aid. Code your data science stuff in MapReduce. So way back when, this was considered the best thing since sliced bread. However, what happened subsequently was Google quietly abandoned MapReduce for the application for which it was purpose built, which is to run their crawl database. So they abandoned, they moved their crawl database on a big table and sort of quietly built other data management solutions like Dremel and F1 and BigQuery. 
And pretty much at Google, MapReduce went into a long sunset swoon. And in 2015, Google officially abandoned MapReduce as having no place in their stack uh, for internal or external use. So here we said something goes from being the best thing since sliced bread to being officially abandoned uh, in less than a decade. Well, that didn't stop Cloudera. So in about 2012 or 2013, it became clear that MapReduce is actually primarily a SQL market. Meaning if you asked Facebook what fraction of your load is in Hive and what fraction of it is in MapReduce, 95, 96, 97 percent of it was in Hive. So, and that Facebook is a huge proponent of MapReduce, or at least it was at the time. So it's clear that, that Hive is the answer and that MapReduce is really a SQL market. And people who code in MapReduce, if there's a few of them, but it's kind of some little eddy off over there someplace. So if you're Cloudera and you're peddling MapReduce, you've got a big problem because MapReduce is not where it's at. So Cloudera did a great bait and switch. They redefined the Hadoop market to not be MapReduce anymore. It's now a three-level stack, SQL at the top, i.e. Hive, uh, MapReduce in the middle, HDFS at the bottom. Well, that lasted only a little while until 2014 when uh, Cloudera released a system called Impala. Impala is a SQL engine because the problem with Hive is it's ridiculously slow. And so clearly you're going to need something better if you wanted to actually have this have some legs. So Impala was released and it's a SQL engine at the top. MapReduce is nowhere to be found and it talks to a file system underneath it. So it's two level stack. So Cloudera redefines it to be a three level stack then throws out the middle tier and this is SQL on top of HDFS. And Mike Olson, who's the chairman of the board of Cloudera, is happy, well, he's not very happy, but if you give him a beer and talk to him privately, he's happy to admit that, that nobody is interested in MapReduce anymore. Uh, the other thing that's a dirty little secret is that Impala is not even based on HDFS. They drill directly through HDFS to the underlying local Linux file system so really, Impala is SQL at the top and Linux files at the bottom, which is exactly how all the data warehouse products also work. So why do they don't like, not like HDFS? Well, nobody wants a very slow location transparent file system that gives database folks a big case of indigestion. In effect, what we're down to is a one level stack SQL. So, what that means is that the data warehouse market, which is SQL, and the Hadoop market are merging. And so uh, I think that's fine. May the best parallel SQL column store win. So one view of, of the Hadoop market is that it's now a SQL market and it's now the data where, you know, part of the data warehouse market. If you want to deploy a data warehouse on top of HDFS, that's fine. The, all the vendors will do it. They're all going to drill through HDFS and talk directly to underlying Linux files. So what's left for HDFS if, if this is a SQL market? Well, again, there's been a great pivot. Uh, the marketing guys have gone to work. And now HDFS is being marketed to support something called data lakes. So that's the new buzzword for what the Hadoop market is. It's about data lakes. First of all, HDFS is a file system. It's hard to imagine getting big bucks for a file system. Uh, that's, that's a commodity thing that should just be around. So, so it's not clear how you're going to get a lot of money by peddling HDFS. And as a data lake, uh, it's certainly possible to use HDFS for a data lake. 
But stay tuned because we're going to talk about the big variety problem in just a little bit. And uh, my contention is that if you just use HDFS, you solve a very small portion of the variety problem and you will get a data swamp instead of a data lake. Anyway, that's to be to come in a, f in a few slides. So now let's go to, so everybody realizes that Hadoop is not the answer. So fast forward to last year. And so uh, what do you say? Well, if you want to do complex analytics, HDFS is too slow and MapReduce is not flexible enough. So enter from stage right, Matei, Zaharia, and Spark. So let's move to a main memory parallel execution environment. Code your analytics in Spark. The new best thing since sliced bread, circa 2015. Uh, IBM and others are drinking the Spark Kool-Aid. And to me, Spark gives me a big case of indigestion. So why is that? Well, first of all, Spark has no persistence, which is, you know, it's a main memory system. When you, when you turn the power off, the data goes away. So where are you going to store the data in between Spark executions? You need some, some companion storage system. So it's not, it's not a database system. It's simply a main memory framework. Second thing, problem with Spark is, so you have this terra, terra store or peta store underneath it somewhere. And you now do some data management. You extract a terabyte and you load it into Spark. So John loads his terabyte into Spark. Let's just say I, uh, I use the exact same terabyte and I load it into Spark. We now have two one terabyte copies in main memory. There is no sharing in Spark. No concept of a shared buffer pool, uh, no sharing whatsoever. No persistence, no sharing. Well, the other thing Matei figured out, which is exactly what Mike Olson figured out a few years earlier, is that users want SQL. So when you time, when you just add up how many Spark accesses there are to their machine learning stuff, to their stream stuff, to their SQL stuff, all their different interfaces. 70% of it is Spark SQL. The main Spark market is SQL, which shouldn't surprise anybody. That was the main Hadoop market too. So now you have uh, the main market is Spark. And database folks look at Spark SQL and say, huh? There's no indexes in Spark SQL. Uh, there's, so there's no persistence, no sharing, no indexes. Uh, this stuff doesn't run very fast. So the other thing that, that Spark does is that if you have terabytes of data and you have something you want to do with it, the standard wisdom in all of computer science is you want to move the small thing to the big thing. And what Spark is doing is the opposite. They're taking a terabyte of data and moving it to main memory, where what you really want to do is take the small thing, this analytic computation, and move it to the data, which is inside the storage engine. So you're doing the wrong thing, which is, and every database person on the planet will grimace. So this all gives database folks a serious case of heartburn. Well, Spark is being used largely for uh, you know, prototyping, and at scale, all of these problems are going to be serious issues. So what's the future of Spark? Well, stay tuned. We have more to say. So let's look at the third option for supporting data science, which is why don't we figure out how to move the query to the data, not the opposite way around. So let's suppose you use your favorite relational database system for persistence. There's a whole bunch of warehouse ones that are pretty good at doing this. And they support all support sharing, and they all support very high performance SQL, or most of them do. So what are you going to do for the analytics if you want to move it inside the DBMS? Well, some guy named Mike Stonebreaker said, let's have user-defined functions in Postgres, and that was 20 years ago. So there is a user-defined function interface. So 
why don't you just, you can write your user to find functions in Spark if you want, or in R, that's very popular for analytic computations, or in C++ or whatever you want. The only problem with this story so far is that the support for user-defined functions is going to have to improve a lot. Most of the systems don't support parallel UDFs, and these are computations that run for quite a while, so you want to make them recoverable, and that stuff doesn't work. So there's a bunch of work the database vendors have to do, but in, in theory, there's nothing that prevents them from running analytics as user-defined functions written in whatever language you want to write them in. Now, the last thing to notice, though, is that these are array calculations. You call a UDF and you have a table system, you're going to have to cast a table to an array. And on all but the largest problems, that conversion is going to be the high pole in the tent. So that's going to be a major problem with, with format conversion you know, in the large. So that brings up the fourth option, which is why don't we get rid of table database systems in this market and move to an array database system? So that says that uh, instead of having to convert to something else to run your analytics, everything is native arrays. You have, you have SQL on arrays or a SQL-like thing. You have analytics on arrays that all runs on the same storage model. And that gives you the same database in database analytics. Write them in R, write them in Spark, don't care. And that gives you no table to array conversion. And the, uh, we, don't want to, we never want to move the data to the query. You always want to do the opposite. That's exactly what the previous solution and this solution both did. This is likely to be the most efficient long-term solution. And uh, whether it will win in the marketplace, who knows. But if you want to look into this, check out a system called SciDB, which is something I am involved in. And there's a thing called SciDBR, which is the way you talk uh, R you know, in a SciDB context. So in my opinion, at least technically, this sort of stuff points the way to the most efficient long-term solution. So now let's move to the future of Spark. So Spark has no persistence, no sharing, uh, <clears throat> and moves, moves the data to the query. So what's almost guaranteed to happen, it's already happening, is the DBMS vendors realize that they're the companion storage engine underneath Spark. And they're realizing that what you want to do is push down everything you can into the database system. So push down filters, push down joins, push down everything where it gets more efficient. So the last thing you want to do is do the SQL up in the Spark layer. You want to do it down in the database layer. So DBMSs will be a persistent layer, persistence layer underneath Spark. You can just see what's coming, which is tighter and tighter and tighter integration with Spark stuff just being called inside database engines. So the database guys will attempt to move Spark as simply you know, a computation platform along with R and anything else. And uh, that, will, that will give Spark a serious case, a serious headache because You'll have the database vendors offering superior functionality, superior performance. So that might well happen. Uh, but in the meantime, this is all the Wild West, which is who knows what the, what's going to happen. What will the Spark market look like in two years? Will it just be uh, user-defined functions inside of data warehouse systems? Will it be user-defined functions inside of array database systems? Uh, will Spark become a storage manager to try and get this tighter integration, which is what the data science guys are, I think, going to want? So anyway, this, hold on to your seatbelt. And the interesting thing is that this is going to be a lot of disruption no matter what. And that means opportunity for people with good ideas. Okay, so that's all I have to say about big volume. Now let's talk about the second V, which is big velocity. Well, I, I've 
been involved in two companies in this space, and they, they are good at very different things. So again, since we know a little bit about electronic trading now, let's take uh, what the electronic trading guys want to do, which is they're looking for a pattern in a fire hose as the ticks go by you uh, on CNBC. So find me a strawberry followed within 100 milliseconds by a banana. So it's that kind of stuff that they want to do. OK, so this is called complex event processing in most uh, venues. And there's a bunch of systems from a decade ago, like Streambase, that are pretty good at this. Uh, there's a bunch of new entrants, like Storm and Kafka, that are pretty good at this. And so go buy a CEP system if you want to look for a pattern in a fire hose. So uh, the only problem with is Storm is the slowest thing on the planet, so use something else. Kafka is pretty good. Kafka has a couple problems that we'll talk about in the next slide. But the second approach, uh, and I'll, I'll again illustrate it using a, an electronic trading example. Uh, there's a big electronic trading company in Chicago called Getco. As of a couple years ago, they single-handedly accounted for about 12% of the New York Stock Exchange trading volume. They have an electronic trading desk in New York, in Chicago, in Singapore, in Tokyo, London, dot, dot, dot. So they're all over the world. And so they have these independent systems trading electronically. This is at millisecond granularity, by the way. So the GetCo CFO says, if we just let everybody do their own thing, what do I do if everybody shorts IBM at the same time? That just will generate too much risk. So what I want to do is assemble my worldwide position for or against every stock I'm trading on millisecond or less granularity. So basically, for every security, assemble my real-time global position. So, and alert me if my exposure is greater than some amount. So that's exactly their application. And you, you look at this and you get in a message and the message says, uh, Tokyo bought 100 shares of IBM. All you want to do is have a database and update the, your, the state of IBM in that database. You want to do this reliably. The minute you lose a message or lose that update, your database is worthless. Uh, you need HA because if you fail, then everything is worthless. So this looks like high performance OLTP. So there are a bunch of systems that are pretty good at high performance OLTP. They usually go under the rubric new SQL engines. So you want to do a million SQL transactions a second. VoltDB will be happy to do that. There are other systems, MemSQL, that are pretty good at doing this. So High performance OLTP says reliably run transactions with failover and fail back and never lose a message and make sure you do you process every message exactly once because you can't process it twice and you can't process it zero times. Okay, so in my opinion, there's a market called important stuff. If if there's money in your message, chances are you want to think of this as important. If you're tagging ducks and they're walking around in the marsh, you can lose lots of messages. Doesn't matter. The important messages are ones that people are going to pay money for. And in this world, you, you demand HA. And most people have, comp have pipelines that are several steps long, not just one. And, and people want exactly once semantics. The, the minute there's money involved, it's got to be exactly once semantics. So transactions with transactional replication do exactly this. And VoltDB and, and MemSQL do exactly this. And the other guys, like Kafka, you have to work your butt off to figure out how to do this. Uh, it can be done, but it is a lot of customization. So my prediction is that in the important message market, the OLTP guys are going to win. And the important message market is anytime there's money involved, 
which makes this a high value market. And at the low end, if you're tracking ducks, you know, there's no money there anyway. So in my opinion, the, the OLTP guys are going to win in this market. So what are the storm clouds to the new SQL guys? Well, first of all, uh, RDMA has appeared on the scene, so and it's pretty darn fast. So that will enable new concurrency control schemes that the current new SQL guys don't implement because uh, they want to try hard to avoid sending messages. That's one possible storm cloud. Second one is Google introduced a system called Spanner. Spanner has synchronous wide area replication. So Getco wants two copies of their database because if one fails, you've got to fail over to the other one transactionally. And Google Spanner is happy to have the second database in Chicago, the primary database you know, here in Palo Alto. So they're willing to do wide area synchronous replication. The reason they can do this with, with latency that's tolerable is that they control the end-to-end -end network and nobody else does. So you've got Spanner works uh, because they have the end-to-end -end solution and they can optimize all stages to keep the latency modest. If you can do Spanner-like things, then it's certainly possible that wide area synchronous replication will become the norm. Uh, from VoltDB's point of view, they don't really care. Right now, you can have synchronous wide area replication or asynchronous wide area replication. Take your pick. If, and everybody chooses to vote with their dollars saying, I'll take asynchronous, thank you very much, because I can't tolerate the latency. People choose the other way. They won't care. So this is all going to be very modest disruption at best. So uh, the CEP guys will duke it out with the OLTP guys. And I don't see a lot of serious storm clouds in this world. <clears throat> So where is the 800-pound gorilla? Uh, it's in the big variety space. So a typical enterprise, you ask somebody like FedEx, how many operational databases do you guys have? The answer is about 5,000. You ask Verizon how many operational databases they have, it's about 10,000. So all of these guys have a data warehouse. And so I ask everyone I can, how many of your operational data sources get into your data warehouse? The answer is typically less than 10. So what about the other 4,990? They are silos that don't get shared with anybody. So the other thing that's, that's getting everybody is that there's a lot of data that's of interest to the corporation that isn't in anybody's operational data store. So the CFO almost certainly does his budget on, on his local laptop you know, in a spreadsheet. That's not, into, that's not shared in any way. And there's a lot of low-end access databases, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more data sources than 5,000 that you'd like to capture. And then the other thing is everybody wants to integrate data off the public web. So, for example, since you guys are now are all experts on El Nino and La Nina because it, it impacts the heck out of your weather, I got to make a sales call at Miller Beer a few years ago. And this was in December of a year where the weather guys were saying, El Nino is coming, El Nino is coming. So we all know that, and uh, we knew at the time, that that, that makes it uh, warmer than normal in the Northeast and wetter than normal in California. And that's exactly what happened this year. So the question I asked the Miller Beer guys was, you know, is our beer sales correlated with weather, with precipitation or temperature? Miller Beer guys had a data warehouse, sales of beer by brand, by time period, by this, by that, by the other thing. And they all said, I wish we could answer that question. But of course, weather data was not in their data warehouse. This is public data that they could readily integrate off the public web. They just didn't at the time. I have no idea whether they do it now. So there's pressure to get integrate more and more data sources. 
So the traditional solution, if you go ask anybody who runs a data warehouse, how do you ingest data into your data warehouse, they will all say they do it using Informatica or using you know, an IBM, pro, pro, IBM uh, system called Information Integrator. How this works is you take your smartest programmer and you have him construct a global schema. This is how the data is going to look in the data warehouse up front. I'll come back in a bit as to why that's hard. But anyway, so you construct a global schema. Then for every local data source that you want to integrate, you send a programmer out to interview the business owner of the data, of the data set, figure out what's in it, how it's, how it's formatted, figure out how to do an extract, uh, how to map it to a, the global schema. Uh, invariably, you have to transform the data because if it's coming from Europe, then the money is in euros and here it's in dollars and you got to do a conversion. Uh, so you got to write a script to transform the data. Worse yet, you got to clean it. And we'll come back to cleaning, but figure, uh, if you want a reasonable figure of metric, met, merit, 20% of your data is wrong. And no one claims it's less than 20% is wrong. So, and, and if you're going to put stuff together, if you put together dirty data, it will, you will create a mess. So you got to clean the data. And then if Mike Stonebreaker is in one database and Michael R. Stonebreaker is in another, you got to do entity consolidation. So you got to figure out how to do all this stuff. And this is a labor intensive with a, an expensive programmer. So this works, twist my arm, I'll give you 25 data sources. Really twist it hard and I'll give you 50. This doesn't work for hundreds, it's just too labor intensive. So who wants to integrate more than 25 or 50 data sources? Well, here's a few examples of real world uh, companies that really want to do this. Okay, so there's a large manufacturing enterprise, which is in fact General Electric. Uh, if you want to, if you work for General Electric and you want to buy a paper clip, uh, you've got to deal with a procurement system. So the procurement system says, here's a purchase order, go down to your local staples, and it'll give you your paper clips. So they have 325 separate procurement systems. You guys are laughing. That's how many they have. Uh, why do they have so many? Well, they, have, have, they buy companies on a routine basis and they usually come with their own procurement system. So they have lots of procurement systems. CFO had the bright idea, suppose we could put together these 325 systems. What that would mean is that if you were a purchase, purchase officer for one of these systems and your contract with Staples came up for renewal, you could find out what the other 324 guys had managed to negotiate. Because the terms and conditions in all of these procurement systems are wildly different. So if you could just get most favored nation status, GE would save $100 million a year. You know, after a while, this actually gets to be a big number. <laughs> So GE is deadly serious about integrating 325 data sources because the upside, if they can solve this problem, is huge. Uh, who else wants to integrate more than uh, 10 or 20 data sources? Uh, it turns out Novartis has about 10,000 bench scientists, chemists and biologists doing wet stuff in the lab and writing down their results in, think of them as electronic lab notebooks. Well, with 10,000 guys, some of whom are in Switzerland, some of them are in Cambridge, some of them are elsewhere, uh, the scientists in general don't know who else is working on the same gook or who else is producing the same, uh, re same output out of different gook. So they want to integrate uh, 10,000 lab notebooks basically for social networking purposes. Uh, again, the N is 10,000. And they even admit it's probably a bigger number by now, maybe 15,000. Uh, there's a large auto company. Their European operation 
uh, has a customer database. The problem in Europe is it has, they have one customer database per country. So when you move from Spain to France, this company loses you completely. Uh, moreover, uh, in Germany, their databases are at the canton level, not even at the country level. They have about 100 or so databases, but they're in 40 languages. And they want to put them together basically so that for cu customer feel-good purposes. So again, N is way more than 25. So there are lots and lots of companies who want to do data integration at scale. Why do they have all these data sources? The answer is really pretty straightforward. They, enterprises divide themselves into business units and the business units are siloed. And they're siloed because you want to be able to get stuff done without asking everybody up to the president for permission to do something or other. So virtually every large enterprise has hundreds to thousands of these. And they have hundreds to thousands of silos. And uh, there's no global data model. There's never a global data model. Most every company tried to build one in the late 1990s. And so they take 10 smart people and say, go off and build us you know, the Verizon data model. And so these guys would start out doing it. They'd go interview all these people. And they'd come back three or four years later with the state of the world as it was four years earlier. Meanwhile, the business has moved on. I've never seen a global mo data model in any large enterprise. So uh, the figure it doesn't exist. And so it amounts to, if there's a global data model, then it also says that which is everybody has got to uh, use the global data model. And standards are impossibly difficult to enforce. Uh, just remember that every enterprise tried to stamp out Macs uh, as the desktop device. And that, see how well that worked. So anyway, there's no global, global data model. We have about 10 minutes, and it'd be Great. really nice if we can have questions. Okay, I'm almost done. Yeah, so everybody wants to integrate silos for all kinds of good reasons. Integrating silos is hard. It's hard because you have to do everything that's up here on the slide, most of which I've already talked about. Why is this hard? Well, here are three possible transactions. I bought 100K of widgets from IBM Incorporated. Uh, I bought a 800K euros of M widgets from IBM SA, which is the Spanish subsidiary. Uh, I bought minus 999 of star with star from this address, which happens to be the headquarters of IBM in the US. So put those three data records together. And it's a little difficult because you might not know that 800K is in euros. Uh, minus 9999 is likely the code for null, and but it's who knows if that's really the case. Star with star means what? You got dirty data. Uh, how to translate currencies? Because you know this is you know a multinational system. Uh, is IBM SA the same thing as IBM Incorporated? Got to do entity resolution. Are M widgets the, widgets the same thing as widgets? All of these problems appear, and they're all a challenge. So this is hard. Data integration at scale is the 800-pound gorilla in the corner. It's the biggest problem facing a lot of enterprises, huge upside, and impossible to solve using traditional techniques. So it's the 800-pound gorilla in the corner. There's a bunch of startups with interesting ideas. Uh, the traditional vendors, ETL is not going to work. It just isn't going to scale. So take a look at a bunch of, a bunch of these companies. Uh, there's interesting ideas. In my opinion, uh, if you're going to do this at scale, you've got to pick the low-hanging fruit automatically. That means machine learning and statistics. Uh, there's never an, a global schema. You've got to build it up bottom up. And You've, when you don't know what to do, you've got to be able to ask a human. But the human you ask is not the ETL programmer. It's a business guy because he's the only one who knows that star, star with star, what it might mean. 
So Tamer is doing this stuff. Others are doing this kind of stuff. Uh, this, this, I think, is a huge problem. So uh, I have two more slides. This one, which is, what's this got to do with data lakes? Or what has data lakes got to do with data integration? Put all your data into a data lake. What you've managed to do so far is ingest all the data into a common place. That is 5% of the problem, 1% of the problem. You've still got all of this other hard stuff to do. That will generate a swamp, for sure. It will not generate a lake. And at the very best, this is an enterprise junk drawer uh, in desperate need of curation. So the takeaway is look for disruption. If there isn't disruption, the, the big boys are going to continue to be the big boys. So disruption will mean opportunity. And I've gone through in this talk where I see there, uh, there to be opportunity. And then look for pain. Pain means that enterprises with big checkbooks are willing to take a risk on startups uh, as opposed to playing it safe. So look for the 800 pound gorilla in this space or whatever other space you're interested in. That's the end of my slides. I hope I've made some people mad by now. <laughs>
and at the risk of sounding defeatist, I'd rather come to the conclusion this just fun, is a fundamentally non-solvable problem. Is there just some reason to believe that after all these decades of trying and failing that there's some new idea that is going to make integration more solvable than it has been in the past? Uh, the, fact that, the fact that it is yet more important to enterprises to solve this problem and if there's a hundred million dollars on the table, you're willing to spend ten of it to solve the problem, uh, whereas historically you weren't willing to you weren't willing to to do ten. But that would argue we're going to solve time travel since there's even more money at the <laughs> uh, I mean, I think I think the answer is it's becoming more and more important to solve it, and you can solve it brute force if you have to. It's just expensive. So, for instance, uh, Groupon the you know, the Daily Deal guys. So they, they want to create an, a worldwide database of small businesses. And they're doing that integrating 10,000 web sources. And they have 600 humans in Indiana who are, who are doing the heavy lifting. So, so people are just willing to pay if, if there's an ROI on doing it. So I think uh, the answer is, this is either a Palantir consulting market or pieces of it will get productized, augmented by some consulting. But say, in the wild, people are really willing to pay. I mean, this is a huge pain point these days. And, and just getting bigger. Because the longer you don't do it, the worse the problem gets. Another question? Yes. So are, are any of your friends thinking about security? Uh, I wish I had a good idea on security because I think that it's a huge problem, and I don't I don't know I, I don't have a good idea. If I had a good idea, I would really I would I would be all over it. I don't have a good idea. I mean, it's a very important problem. Yes, well, along those lines, how do you keep a runaway query in the database from just exhausting resources? Oh, yeah. The current warehouse guys all do that right now by setting setting a budget and and you exceed your budget, you know they kill you. Okay. So I mean that's that's not difficult at all because they all keep track of resource consumption. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, John. Awesome. Another one. That's right. Why does you mention the possibility of SQL becoming? Uh, oh, sorry, the, the possibility of array database management systems and. I thought I heard you say SQL in the same sentence, but maybe I didn't. But it's, why does SQL make sense as a query language for an array DBMS? It seems like it's a fundamentally different model, which would probably want a different kind of language to describe operations. Okay, so so the CIDB guys have a thing called array SQL, which which has project and join and select from where. It looks like SQL unless you squint, and the minute you squint, the semantics are different. And anybody in the business world says that's a good idea. Anybody in the science world who's, say, an R programmer thinks that's ridiculous. And they want a functional language that says, join this to this, and then do that, and then do the following thing. So CIDB has both interfaces. Take your pick. Uh, how, how, I think, what's going to have to happen is, first of all, so CIDB is focused just almost completely on the genomics market. And what those guys actually want for a query language remains to be seen. And so CIDB will do whatever those guys want. And I think it'll, it'll unfold over time. Okay, so let's, we have three more questions. And we'll stop. One, two, and then three. Go ahead. So uh, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts around graph databases and graph query languages? Uh, as, as near as I can tell, in the, in the complex analytics world, it's 80 or 90 percent arrays and 10 or 20 percent graphs and 0 percent tables. And there are some people who are really interested in, in graph databases. The CIA is my best example. Uh, if you think they're keeping a database of every phone number and who talks to who, uh, I didn't tell you this, but you assume it's true. <laughs> and they're looking for terrorist cells, which is compute, computer, compute cliques in a, in a, in a graph. Now, we had a little contract with them that did this, and we did a little benchmark that had 100 million phones and looked for cliques in 100 million phones. 
And their reaction was, that's not nearly big enough. So, so there are definitely people who really want to do graph calculations at scale. And so I think it, it's, it's a market, it's definitely a market, but I think it, it's smaller than the array market. Okay. Uh, I really, I mean, it is a big pain point, but then you do it once and then you have some data integrated. Now you want to get integrated another data source. Do you think people are offering incremental approaches or methods that then make it easier or cheaper to integrate that, uh, that doing that incremental? That, that's the hope. That is the hope. Because if, if, if that's not true, then it's a Palantir style consulting market. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so the hope is, is that there's enough commonality that, that you can do, do a bunch of this with a product as yeah. opposed to just custom code. But right now it's just a hope. Not, you haven't, haven't, have you seen Kamen's any evidence? doing pretty well. Okay. You know, you, if you focus narrowly, then then you can get, then there's a lot of commonality. Okay. Focusing broadly is not going to work. Carter? What's the future of NoSQL databases? Well, there's 150 or 200 commercial products, and I think uh, all but two of them have to go out of business. <laughs> what do the two of them do? Can you stay in business? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think the an the simple answer is that the NoSQL guys, first of all, they need standards because 150 disparate systems have no chance. Yep. So what's the standard going to be? Well, SQL. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, SQL equals SQL. <laughs> Cassandra and Mongo are both building high-level interfaces that, unless you squint, look like SQL. Mm -hmm. So no SQL to me means not yet SQL. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and, and then I think the other thing is that Mongo is being embarrassed by not having a good transaction system. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and I think the relational guys are all implementing JSON uh, to do, do better on semi-structured data. So I think no SQL and SQL are going to merge. And may the best vendors win. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Mike. Yeah. Thank